despite the image of Canada as a frozen wasteland, when no one was, was, was looking, Canada became the most successful country in the world. Uh, what binds the, the, the country together in terms of values is the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If you would come to Canada, as soon as you would cross the border, you would be protected. You would come under the protection of the Charter of Rights, which is different in its structure from the American Bill of Rights. But if you talk to my students and you talk about their values, they have charter values. They are charter Canadians. Now, the incandescent moment for the country was the sovereignty referendum of 1995. Uh, where the Quebec gov government held um, uh, a referendum on Quebec sovereignty. <coughs> Canada had been living in a constitutional war, war zone, uh, a divided and traumatized country where there was incredible political wreckage. People, nothing was getting done. Um, it, was, it was a pessimistic time, it was a grim time, and it was a time of uh, raw emotions. On that night, on that night, when Quebec voted, 49.6% uh, voted for the separatist side that Quebec should be a separate state. 50.4, 50.4 voted for Canada. And had it been the difference of three or four uh, points, uh, Quebec sovereignty would have been declared that night. Now, I was working as an advisor to the uh, Alberta government, so I was getting the overnights. And about a week before the, uh, the referendum, we started getting these overnights, like 56% for the, the we side, 58%, um, and then the Wednesday, the 54%, and then the Thursday, the 58%. And on Saturday night, it came in at 56%. And my wife and I were having lunch on the Sunday before the Monday, which was going to be the, uh, the uh, election. And uh, you know, I said, Canada is just, like it's done. Like I just got the overnights, like it's, we're done here. And I can't tell you the level of panic that ran through the country uh, and desperation. You phoned the prime minister's office and people didn't know what to say to you. And I, I know that night, the night of the referendum, uh, the chief parliamentary correspondent for CBC Television uh, was asked to prepare uh, a talk on what happens if Quebec declares independence that night and if the we side wins. And basically something like uh, keep calm, your money is secure in the banks, no violence, Canada will continue. And so the night goes on and it's 9 o'clock, it's 9.30, it's 10 o'clock, and the separatist side is winning, right? And they keep on, go his producer keeps on going to him and saying, Jason, uh, you know, it, you, where's the speech? Have you, have you written the speech? And, he, and, and Jason keeps on saying, no, I, I, haven't, I haven't written a speech, I haven't written a word. And, and so the producer says, why? And he says, well, my mother hasn't voted yet. And he says, my mother is in a lineup with all kinds of other people from all over the world, and they're being allowed to vote uh, because they're, they're overrunning the polls. And every time the producer would say, well, maybe it's time to speak, and he'd say, no, my mother hasn't voted yet. And what he meant by that was not only his mother, but all the other mothers from places like Poland and Haiti and the Philippines and Sudan and Morocco, they were the ones that brought Canada over the top. They were the ones that made the difference. So how would you feel if your country went through something like that? How would your behavior change if you saw your dreams for your country ripped apart? Like we have to start imagining something new. Well, one of the things that, that happened in Canada is, first of all, in Quebec, I think people s were saying, Canada is not my dream, <coughs> but it could be my second dream. We can, we can have a, another dream. You know, not as good as my first dream, but we can still have a just society. But what Canada did was, Canada took collectively 
took the explosives off the table. So to avoid any painful and divisive issues that would open up old wounds. So the Harper conservatives, who are far more conservative than the country that they govern, which is a very liberal country, basically agreed to the following. We will never question Medicare. 80% of Canadians think that Medicare is the key to democracy. They love Medicare. We will not only never question Medicare, we will increase spending on Medicare by 6% a year. And they've done that uh, basically for the last six or eight years. We will never open up the Constitution. They can, they've come close on Senate reform, but they will never actually open up a constitutional issue. They have agreed publicly, and the House of Commons has passed a resolution that Quebec is a nation within Canada, and given Quebec a seat at uh, UNESCO. Same-sex marriage, done. It's over. We will never raise that issue again, because Quebec is one way, British Columbia is another way, anybody under 45 is one is is another way, like, you, we cannot go there. Abortion. He signed a declaration before the last election that they will never, ever, ever introduce uh, a bill on abortion. Now, there are two uh, members of parliament who wish to speak on the issue of sex selection abortion. People who, uh, you know, find out that uh, they're carrying a, a girl and they want an abortion, or, uh, you know, they, or a boy and they want an abortion. They want 60 seconds to speak in the House of Commons. And Harper is coming down. Harper will not give them 60 seconds to speak. And not only that, they're just being, uh, they're just uh, outcasts within the party. Uh, capital punishment, same thing. We will not discuss capital punishment. Omnibus bills that carry 40, you know, 800 pages long that carry 40 bills in them you know, are passed literally without debate. Um, we will not discuss religion in public. We don't discuss religion in public. It's a private matter. So you have people who have been prime ministers who are very religious. Uh, Mr. Petian would be one of them. Mr. Trudeau would be another one. But it's not something that comes up. So the mayor of my city is a Muslim. He's a Muslim. Um, the fact that he's a Muslim was never, never raised during the election. And two days after he won, he had to host a mayor's breakfast, a mayor's prayer breakfast. And so, <laughs> so he, he said he was terrified because it would come up for the first time. And he was even more terrified when they, uh, they brought ham and eggs. Um, <laughs> 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 and then he found out that, of course, he decided to embrace it. Well, I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to embrace it. And sort of everybody in the audience embraced it as well. But it also affects the way Canadians behave. So in Europe, uh, when you're in a group, silence will, mean, silence will mean agreement. In Canada, silence often means disagreement. It means, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to fight with you on this. Uh, I'm going to be polite, and, and let's move on. What Canadians don't understand about Americans is people who willfully divide their own country, or go to extremes, or take policies that they know are divisive and are rewarded for. It. And so Canadians have a, a bit of trouble with that. We're, we, we don't understand it, because it's everything that is in our DNA now about what can happen if people you know, uh, choose to go to war with each other. There are three main political parties in Canada. One is the Conservative Party, which governs, led by Stephen Harper. Uh, there's the New Democratic Party, Her Majesty's uh, Loyal Opposition, which is a socialist party. Uh, Jack Layton uh, was the leader of that party and, and got passed away two months after the, uh, the election. Uh, his wife is Olivia Chow, who is also a member of parliament in Toronto. Uh, the Liberal Party, uh, which represents downtown Toronto, 
<laughs> and the Greens. Uh, I normally would have not have mentioned the Greens, but in the last two by-elections, they got uh, both 25 and 35 percent of the vote. Uh, could you imagine in the third district in Utah if all of a sudden uh, a green candidate got a green candidate got 35 percent of the vote? Uh, well, that's exactly what <laughs> what happened. So. Uh, we don't know what to expect for the Greens, but there seems to be this grassroots, particularly among young people, that they want to make a statement. So elections last for 36 days. U.S. elections <laughs> uh, can effectively go on for months. So in a, t in a time that it takes a U.S. campaign to gear up, a Canadian campaign is already over. And Canadian campaigns, because they're 36 days, are history on the run. You have a limited amount of time to define your opponent, to define yourself, to win the media battle. And, and because it's so short, you have to win the media battle every single day. There's little time to recover from mistakes. And there, and there could be sudden death. Right? I, I mean, there are moments where a, a campaign can just implode. So uh, the famous campaign where the first woman prime minister, Kim Campbell, this is not because she was a woman, she, it's just she was a, quite a brilliant woman, but brilliant person. But the first day of the election uh, in 1992, she gets out and makes us a press conference. Uh, they ask her uh, what her solution is to unemployment. And she says, well, unemployment is, is high unemployment is, is a persistent problem. We can't talk about it in the election. And I don't think there's any, any easy solutions. Uh, perfectly reasonable and honest statement. Um, her campaign manager, Jody White, gets back into the limousine, absolutely dissolves in tears, because she knows that at that moment, the Conservatives lost the election. Uh, there was a moment when uh, Stéphane Dion, who was leader of the Liberal Party, He's doing a TV interview a week to go before the election, the, 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 the ballot. Um, his first language is French. Um, so when he gets a question in English, he does this translation. And then, so when he's tired, he can't translate properly. So it was late in the day. It was like the third week of the campaign. He's doing this TV interview in the Maritimes in Atlantic Canada, uh, you know, the 5.30 news. Uh, Mr. Dion uh, hears a question, gives it to him in English, and he, he can't translate it quickly enough. So he just blanks out, asks him again. Uh, he can't translate it quickly enough and blanks out. And at that moment, right, that was the, that was the headline. That was the, you know, that was the defining moment, right? He can't do it. He just can't do it. He can't even do an interview. So, Unlike in the United States, the, uh, the electorate is extremely volatile. So uh, in looking at American elections, uh, you know, the, the scorecard for Romney and, uh, and Obama was the polls literally didn't move for, for months. Right? So one day it could be uh, you know, Obama at 48 and Romney at 46, or the next day Obama at 47 and Romney at 45. And it was like, you know, it was literally unmovable for, for months. Um, and it was almost like both sides are, are just getting out their demographics. In Canada, roughly a third of voters do not decide, um, or th at least a third of the vote voters can switch their votes. They're movable. Uh, most people won't pay attention until the week before. Uh, most people will not decide until the last weekend. And it's only in the last weekend when the ballot question uh, is constructed. So it's really the last week, the last three, four, or five days that the election kind of really takes place. And so there are these wild swings. So the 2004 election, I phoned the CBC election desk on Friday afternoon, Friday before the Monday. And I speak to my friends and I say, uh, what's, uh, what's the result? And they said, well, we've taken our polls, we've done our overnights. Uh, the, the conservatives will win a minority government. 
And it stays that way through Saturday. On Sunday, Stephen Harper says, uh, I guess the West is now going to be running the country. Ooh. And within 6 to 12 hours, or 12 to 6 hours to 4 hours, the lead dissolves. You can almost feel this sense of the air pressure changing. You know, Ontario is reacting, and Ontario is reacting massively. And by Monday, it's over, and it's a different government, and the Liberals have won again. In the last election, uh, I could give you other elections, but in the last election, not a single pollster, and some of these are American pollsters, international pollsters, um, not, not a single pollster predicted the election. Um, so I, I'm working for Global Television, and I come in on Monday night, and you know I'm seeing these poll results, and they all say minority government. And, uh, and I, I'm talking to everybody else. There's 21 camera, uh, camera crews. And uh, we're at Harper's headquarters. And uh, one guy says to me, uh, everybody says, uh, it's going to be a long night. One guy says to me that he's spoken to the Tories. There's one last poll that they know about, a party poll. And they're all very happy. Um, so none of the polls saw the orange crush, uh, which was the, the NDP resurgence, the collapse of the Bloc Québécois, the collapse of the, of, the, of the Separatist Party, the collapse of the Liberal Party, all of which took place in the last week. And the orange crush that comes across the country from Quebec is massive. Right? It's just massive. And the pollsters don't pick it up until the last weekend. Um, now, I do want to talk about Jack Layton, who, who died uh, right after the election, about two, week, two months after the election. So he's doing the French language leaders debate. And the polls show that he has lost the debate by 25 points. <coughs> and then what seems to have happened is kind of a delayed action feud. You know, a slow moving kind of decision where people over water coolers, over, uh, you know, over lunches, you know, over, you know, with their families suddenly decide, you know, not suddenly, but three or four or five days later, it hits, he's the one. We like him. And, you know, it's charisma, right? It's over and above organization, over and above databases, over and above the ads, over and, over and above policies. It's just this wave, right? This wave of, of love for this man. Uh, you know, and what, if, you know, as students, like what, what makes charisma, right? What makes you suddenly identify with somebody that you didn't identify with before and say, okay, he's the, he's the person, right? I, I trust him, I can trust him. And nobody, nobody saw that coming. Um, but what it did was it allowed Stephen Harper in the last weekend of the campaign to frame the ballot question. And the ballot question becomes, Canada is the leader of the G7, we have the most investments, we have the most jobs, we have the best future, you know, we have the most stable banking system. Are you gonna trust us, or are you going to take a flyer with these guys? I mean, we like him too. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. But are you going to take a flyer with this guy? And that catapults him in the last weekend to a majority. So what happens? All the pollsters are wrong. And right after the election, they start talking, uh, basically apologizing to the public and publishing their methodologies and talking about how they were wrong. I mean, is it the cell phones? Which, you know, you can, you can, you can get to cell phones, and pollsters can get to cell phones in Canada, where people uh, will refuse to answer because, thank you, it's my minutes. Uh, and 80% of people are now refusing to, uh, to be interviewed. So they do their methodologies, their methodologies all make sense until two days before. And basically, 
it's too fast moving for them to, uh, to pick up on. It's like quicksilver dissolving in their hands. Like they can't even take a snapshot because it's moving too quickly. So that's the nature of, of how volatile it is in Canada. Uh, there's much less money spent in Canada in elections than in the United States. So uh, in your election cycle, the cost is two to three billion. Um, the famous super PACs, of course, with um, run by third-party interests that um, run parallel campaigns or shadow campaigns to the Republicans and the Democrats with anonymous donors who can give tens of millions of dollars. In Canada, there are severe spending limits. A national party is limited to uh, $20 million for the entire campaign. Candidates for parliament can only spend $80,000 uh, if they violate uh, those spending laws, as we've seen in Canada in the last month, uh, you have to resign your seat, Mr. Kenoshawe. Uh, there are no super PAC equivalents. Uh, third parties can only spend $3,000 per district, per riding. There's no corporate donations, there's no union donations, and individuals can only give $1,100 uh, to a campaign. And there's massive reimbursement uh, from the federal treasury back to the political parties and uh, candidates. So both systems have their flaws. Uh, in the US, there's too much money. And I just read uh, Al Gore's book, and he talks about the banks and the interest groups and the insurance companies and Wall Street having this blocking power and being actually in the room <coughs> when legislation is, uh, is being written up. And uh, you know, having their lawyers there who say, Let's try this word. <laughs> we really like this word. So the campaigns in the US are much bigger. Uh, the, the ads, the databases, the staffs, they're orders of magnitude larger than Canadian campaigns. Uh, a Canadian war room would be 100 people. Uh, that would be it. Um, now, I do want to discuss digital, digital media. Um, Canadian parties are fully loaded in terms of websites, Facebook pages, YouTube channels, uh, Twitter accounts, but it's all top down. It's all one way, it's unidirectional, there's no interactivity, there's tight control. And the reason is that um, they want to avoid debate. They don't want uh, the nut bars or the crazies to get onto their sites and start talking about issues that will be embarrassing or the politicians are trying to, to avoid. The effect on reporters uh, is, of Twitter at least, has been startling, very dramatic and very shocking. First of all, you're expected to post all the time. And you're part now of a kind of national bulletin board where everybody is reading your post. So the political parties have minders, and they will be messaging you all day, saying, you forgot this, uh, think about this in your story. Like they're trying to torque your story as you're writing. Um, your editors can read your story and make corrections all day long. Other journalists are commenting on your story. Critics are commenting on your story. So you're posting your story, and then you may get 500 people telling you you were wrong. What a lousy story. Don't you know anything? And so, um, <laughs> so the notion of being always on, always filing, always answering, always writing for 20 hours a day. And I, you, know, you speak to these <laughs> people who come off, and it's like ping pong, right? They're playing ping pong 20 hours a day and very fast. And you can't miss a shot. And they are just, I mean, it's like talking to uh, people who've been through a war. I, I, I mean, I, this one lady reporter who's a national reporter said, you can't imagine the hurt. You can't imagine the hurt because every second day, somebody is saying you're wrong correcting you publicly, beating you up. You know, I am so hurt. 
And so, uh, and no time to think, no time to observe, have deeper thoughts, have deeper discussions, figure out the mood of the country. Um, I just want to quote, this may seem a little strange, but the same phenomenon uh, occurring among sports reporters. This is uh, more Roy McGregor. And certainly there's nothing, if you're Canadian, there's nothing that can happen to you that's better than being elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. And um, Roy McGregor was just elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. And he's talking about the pressures that sports journalists are under. Today's sports reporters are not entirely to blame for the confused state of sports journalism. The various platforms they work for treat them like hamsters, stuck in an endless wheel, spinning nowhere. They must set up games, tweet from morning skates, transcribe tape, blog from the rink, upload video, talk to endless radio stations, chatter, file, file, file. There's no longer time for the leisurely chat with players that used to produce such considerable thought or insight. And my colleague, Christopher Waddell, Basically, his hypothesis is the more reporters are on social media, the more they live in an inner world, in an inner circle of themselves, and the more they're cut off from the country at large. So uh, in the last election, uh, there were 18 to 24,000 tweets a day about the election. If we factor in retweets, you're really talking about four or 5,000 people uh, in a population of 35 million uh, talking about the election. So <coughs> my favorite quote from the election, right? <laughs> so a week before the, the end uh, of the 2011 election, a, a liberal organizer phones the, the head of communications for the Conservative Party uh, and says, you know, and sorry for this language, we are kicking your ass all over social media. And the conservative says, perhaps you're kicking our, your, our ass in social media, but wait till you see the truck come. And a week later, the truck came. Now, just, uh, just to end, I, I, about big data, which I think should be uh, of concern to everybody in this class. The Obama campaign uh, used was state of the art in terms of big data. Uh, every time you went to the Obama election site, there were 76 tracking devices uh, that would follow you. You know, what you buy, what you read, your subscriptions, the, what you joined, uh, who you belong to, who your friends are, your income, all of that. So every news site, I mean, every campaign does that. Every news site does that except for Wikipedia, which doesn't do that. But the Obama campaign was able to score every single American. So basically to track and score 300 million people with 100 information points about every, at least 100 information points about everybody in this room. And they also had an experimental uh, program about the best way to reach you. So it was you know, should we visit you? Should we send you a brochure? Should we email you? Should we contact you through social media? So it's not o only what they knew about you, but it was the gateway to get to you. So we saw this hyper-targeting based it in, on individuals. And the, the goal, of course, highly successful, and what a machine, but it was to get out the vote. I mean, we've never seen such sophisticated hyper-targeting now, if you're on Facebook, uh, or Google, or Apple, or Amazon, or ABC, or Disney, you know the score. Okay, there's a deal that's going on. The deal is that they have, they track you. And they track you, you know, what you buy, what you're searching for, uh, where you shop, what you listen to, I mean, all of that. But you give that up in exchange for something. So you give up your privacy in exchange, uh, in exchange for being on Facebook and all the things that Facebook will do for you. And you know, John McNally of uh, Sun's 
microsystem says, you've already given up your privacy, so get used to it. So we all know that exchange. Like we're all, everything about us is known to others. Now, in Canada, the Canadian political parties are still in the minor leagues in terms of big data. The chief electoral officer and the privacy commissioner argue that we have to prevent political parties from having this information about you. It's dangerous, uh, it can be misused, it can be made public, it can be used to spy on opponents. There's a lot of good things, uh, there's a lot of bad things that are exceedingly dangerous. So let me ask you, just to conclude, um, knowing something about the American Republic and its founders, what do you think Thomas Jefferson would think of big data? What do you think Benjamin Franklin would think of these invasions of privacy? What do you think John Adams would think of it? When, what would his position be about you know, political parties knowing almost everything about your life? What would they think? Well, I just wanna, wanna say that in all of these election systems, there has to be a balance between the good things that happen in the election and harmful things. Too much money, loss of privacy, uh, desperate politicians, all of that. So the question I leave you with, are citizens being well served? Are our two countries being well served by our election systems? Thank you.